Hi, everybody. It is Tuesday night. <laughs> I had to think for a second. What day is today? So hoping a couple people get joined in here in a minute, and then we'll get started. <clears throat> I wish there was a way. And maybe you guys know. Can I, can I alert people ahead of time so that the people watching the replay won't find all this chatter and nonsense up front it drives me crazy when somebody else does it so so hopefully people will get it joined in here we'll ask do some q a <clears throat> nobody Nobody. There's somebody. Hello. Who's here? A couple people are here. Hey, Larry. How's Duncan? Not going to answer me. <laughs> All right. Well, hopefully a couple of people will join. So I'll just I'll go ahead and get started with a couple of thoughts. And maybe people will join us in a few minutes. So I made a big announcement on my dog training page a little while ago. And, oh, what's he eating? Tell me what he's eating. So I made a big announcement on my dog training page that I, hi, Mandy, long time no see, that I am going to be pulling back from um, the board and train portion of my training business. And the reason for doing that is I want to spend the next several months really shifting gears into this nutrition, wellness, and aromatherapy thing. So I have a number of classes coming up that I'm taking and in turn things that I want to be teaching and doing for all of you. Um, I'm going to Healing Touch workshop in a couple of weeks in Raleigh and that is sort of a therapeutic touch with animals uh, essential oils are paired with that so I'm going to that in July I am attending a four-day workshop on um, essential oils for animals and a raindrop technique certification program and where else am I going? Oh, I'm going to the Healthy Dog Conference for Volhard in May. And um, the Young Living Animal Conference in October. I am finishing up my French certification, my French aromatherapy certification, which means I have to write my final paper in the next couple of weeks. And... I really want to shift into more education in this group. And I'll just be very transparent with all of you. I have really struggled with the how much information do I give in the hopes that somebody might hire me um, or come to one of the workshops or any or maybe even buy the oils or the food. And I have struggled with that. And so I have not been as authentic as I want to be because I'm like, ah, don't do that here. I'm going to do it over here and you need to be on an email for this and blah, blah, blah. And that is not me. That's not how I function. It's not what I like. It's not a natural flow for me. And I'm stopping it. I'm stopping the madness. <laughs> and we're going to just have conversations and share information and education. We're going to be compliant and we're going to let the universe take care of things. <laughs> Hang on a second. I got a weenie dog trying to jump up on the chair. I quit getting down. You stay there. <clears throat> so anyway, 
Uh, and I also want to write a book. I am, and I've been feeling this way for a little while, called to write a book. And this, the first, the one I want to do is really going to be based on essential oils from a dog trainer's perspective, right? How they affect behavior, how we can use it, how nutrition starts to affect behavior and the things that we can do about that. So that leads us into getting together tonight. And I just wanted to touch base with you guys a little bit about some of this nutrition stuff that's going on. So on my dog training page the other day, I posted, um, I saw yet another dog that is, um, the owner is basically theorizing, we don't have any proof, that um, the food that they have been feeding contributed to their dog's um, demise. And so there are some class action lawsuits that are going on out there right now with, um, good, Mandy, <laughs> you might need to be my proofreader. <laughs> um, there are a couple class action lawsuits going on out there right now. And so everybody is concerned about that. And then you've got Dr. Becker and Rodney Habib who are doing fabulous work and doing a ton of education. But in their group um, that is about dog cancer and nutrition, they've gotten everybody up in a panic. I mean, I'm seeing people out going, where do I buy magnesium? Where do I buy so-and-so? Where do I get this? And everybody is just a little bit alarmed. So I wanted to just bring all this to the table and have a conversation with you guys from my point of view. So we know that kibble is really not our best option. Fast food is not our best option for you and me either, and yet we still sometimes swing by McDonald's or the Dunkin' Donuts or the whatever it is, right? So not everybody is prepared or even can afford to make the switch into um, fresh, real, raw-based diets. So what I want to say is do as much better as you can. It is a struggle for me personally with my own diet. I like sweet tea. I'm addicted to it. I'm convinced of that. When I am traveling and out doing consultations and on the road, it is convenient to swing in to one of these fast food places. Um, so none of us are eating optimally unless you're a chef and, you know, really committed to all this stuff and have the budget to do it. So I don't want you to panic about feeding your dog, but I do want you to start to learn um, and start to add better ingredients wherever you can. If you are, and, and let me just walk through this process a little bit, right? So grocery store kibble is probably your very worst option. And I hope that none of you are in that space. If you are, I beg you to step up the ladder um, to a better quality kibble if that's the only thing that you can afford. No matter what kibble you feed, you want to start adding fresh, real foods to the bowl. So people tell me all the time, I never feed people food. In today's world, that's probably an error. The more alive, the more real, um, close to alive ingredients as we can add, the better. So think fresh leafy greens, think zucchini squash, yellow squash, butternut squash, any of those kinds of things, right? Even some fruits. If you have a dog with diabetes or is in a cancer space, then you probably want to stay clear of the fruits and the rices and the potatoes, right? You're hearing people start to talk about putting the dog into ketosis. You've heard that same kind of thing. A lot of humans are on these keto diets. 
it's not something that you can just jump to. You kind of got to make a plan and a strategy to get there. Our pets that have been fed kibble-based diets their entire lives or for the last number of years, they no longer actually make the enzymes that they need to make to start breaking down fresh real foods. The body had turned it off, said, you don't, you don't need that. You're not using it, so I'm going to quit wasting that energy. So when you start adding these fresh real foods to your bowls, um, you probably need to add some supplements to do that. And there are lots of options. We can stay in the Young Living family of products, or we can stay in my Volhard Nutrition family of products and get digestive enzymes into that animal, right? Um, there is a supplement from Volhard if you're going to continue feeding kibble called Endurance that helps beef up the nutrient um, quality and the nutrient content and the nutrient balance. So if I were still feeding kibble, I would be adding um, endurance to my dog's diet. But I made the change a few years ago to feed um, a raw diet. And I am not the person that's going to go to the grocery store or the butcher or the wherever and get um, bone and muscle and organ and meat and vegetables and then go online and find this supplement and this vitamin and that mineral and make a recipe. That's, that's not who I am. If my dog's life depended on it, right, if they were seriously unhealthy and their life depended on that style of feeding, then that's what I would do. But I found Volhard Dog Nutrition and started feeding that and I loved it so much I actually then became a consultant and it's kind of driven me down this nutritional path in addition to my essential oils work. So that's an option for those of you who want to get into that kind of thing. Not ready to go raw, endurance. Ready to go raw but don't want the hassle of it all, then NDF2 is a great product for you to consider. Making a homemade food is a good option, but you need a balanced recipe. So I often see people who say, we're doing home cooked. Great. What is it? And they'll tell me lean chicken, some sort of rice, and they think brown rice is way better than white rice. Maybe not. Um, or sweet potatoes, carrots, and peas, and they think that's fantastic. Probably not, right? Because they're using the leanest cut of chicken, they're missing the calcium, and they're missing um, the fat. They're also missing those cruciferous vegetables and those green leafy vegetables. So there are options, right, for you to think about what, what can I do? If you could do nothing else, add fresh leafy greens to your kibble bowl. You need to blanch them a little bit and start whirling them through the puree a time or two. They don't need to be mush, but they need to start spinning down a little bit. Um, and any vegetable like that that you're feeding your dog needs a light blanch, not cooked, just lightly steamed, lightly blanched, and then a whirl through the puree and then add it to the food bowl, okay? And probably a digestive enzyme, right? One of the things that I like to add for dogs who, and honestly, I add it for me. <laughs> I don't eat a balanced diet often enough. It is, it's the worst thing. I need to do it, I need to do better. But I take a supplement called um, Multigreens, which has things like kale and spirulina and seaweed and all sorts of stuff in it. And I start adding that as a way to get more green nutrient into my body. For clients that I'm working with whose dogs have, have been really unwell, like they've come into rescue and you can look at that dog and say, you hadn't had anything of nutrient quality and I don't know when. Let's start supporting the body system to, to get into some recovery. 
then a supplement like that is a good one to start putting greens into the system when perhaps the dog is saying, I don't know what that stuff you put in my bowl is, but I ain't eating it, <laughs> right? I mean, they're only going to eat so much kale and so much spinach and so much broccoli, right? That's true for you and me. We need to eat more of it, but we can't always, and we don't always put it on the plate. So there are supplements that will help with that sort of thing. So just be aware if you're making a homemade diet, you've got to look for a balance of um, vitamins, minerals, protein, organ meat, muscle meat, calcium that may come in the form of bone or eggshells, um, that kind of thing. If you're still feeding kibble and you think, okay, I'm going to add some fresh real meat and you start throwing um, a piece of venison, right? Or a raw hamburger or a raw steak or whatever into the bowl. On an occasional basis, that's okay. On an occasional basis, that's okay. If that becomes the norm, then you have to offset that meat with calcium, meaning the bone, right? You, you can't just throw the meat without throwing the bone. And so this is where people start to get a lot of confusion and a lot of frustration because it really is about the balance, okay? So I've kind of moved into this raw thing, and that really wasn't my intent. We'll come back and answer any questions that you guys have about it. But so <clears throat> going back to the kibble, in if I were feeding kibble in today's world, the, the level of kibble that I would be choosing would be at origin, akana, from, signature, that level of food. You can go to dogfoodadvisor.com and look at a um, basically an unbiased score of the kibble choice that you have currently and see what they say. It'll show you the, the, the constituent makeup of that food and give it a rating based on quality, recall factors, and all that kind of stuff, right? So we know we've been following this for a while. Maybe some of you have and some of you haven't, which is why I wanted to call this out. I put it on my dog training page and people panicked. Blue Buffalo has a class action lawsuit against them that's been going on now for over a year um, with claims of lead in their dog food. And we are seeing a lot of people now come in to um, make comment and share their experience with their dogs and that dog food. I can't tell you whether that's fact or not, but enough reading about this says to me, I don't want you guys feeding that, <laughs> right? Do your homework, make the best decision that you can make, but know that there are enough concerns being mounted that there is now a class action lawsuit and a lot of people sharing their story that says there's a problem there, okay? Somebody on my dog training page the other day said, well, I feed that and I've never had a problem. I used to be of that mind. And now I say, well, I've eaten at McDonald's a whole lot and I've never had a problem, but I know it ain't good for me. Pardon, my <laughs> pardon the Southern there, right? It's not. And if I ate it every day, it is going to compound and at some point is likely to take me out. And this is what happens. So when we get into the conversations where we're going to talk about chemical load and vaccines and all of that that's happening out on those Zoom calls, um, and I'm going to try to bring more of that stuff into the group. But in, in Dr. Um, no, he's not a doctor. Rodney Habib talks about this when he talks about his dog and what actually led him into doing all this research on nutrition is that all these veterinarians and all these doctors talk about 
the microchondria of our cells and how it starts to get damaged. And if you think about those, um, are they called derby cars? You know, the cars that used to crash into each, I don't even think we do that anymore. Um, box car derby, Larry, you'll know what I'm talking about. Demolition derby, that's what it's called. So they would, they'd drive around and they'd smash into each other and they'd smash into, and they'd keep going and they'd smash into each other and they'd keep going and they'd smash into them until they didn't run anymore. And so the, the theory, and it's been proven, is that that's what happens to the cells of our body, that they keep getting damaged, they keep getting harmed, and they fight back and they fight back and they keep going until they can't, right? And so that's where we start saying, how can we reduce harsh chemical load? How can we add in better nutrient? How can we support the body as it's going through a vaccination series? How can we support the body after it had to have antibiotics for an illness that it experienced, right? How can we eliminate things going in? How can we uh, manage waste through kidney and liver support and so on? Where can we apply natural things to help the body do its own best recovery with um, cellular support. And it begins, it begins with the food. So if I am suspicious of the food that has lead in it, I'm not gonna feed it. And I would never recommend that to any of you. So then yesterday, we saw a class action lawsuit come up against Origin and Akana's manufacturer. It's called Champion Foods. And so they've already responded back. And so that, if you go read them, and you should, if you're feeding these foods, you should go read this information and make your own best educated decision. Um, but they, basically, you and I are exposed to heavy metals and environmental toxins every single day. So is your animal, right? And if we were to be tested, and if we start testing a lot of our foods and things that we're putting into our bodies, chances are those heavy metals exist there as well. So these foods, somebody tested them, some independent something, came back and said, we're seeing heavy metals in um, these brands of food as well. Those levels are significantly below what the government said is okay, an acceptable level. Now, a lot of, so I then go, well, what level of lead or what level of heavy metal or what level of arsenic, so there's arsenic in rice, right? <laughs> what level is appropriate for any of us? And the thing is, we can't get away from it, right? There's, there's, there's something just about in everything, unless we're growing it and processing it and managing ourselves, and that we knew the soil that we planted those things in or the farm that we grew the cattle on had never been exposed to pesticides and was not getting any sort of wind current bringing anything our way. It's Unfortunately, this stuff is everywhere and it's all around us. And we have companies that are acting without integrity and we have, um, there, there's just a whole bunch of stuff, right? So based on what I've read, and this is Dana Brigman's opinion, take it for the penny that it's worth, um, I, I would be concerned about Blue Buffalo. And if I had to use a kibble-based product, I am still in that family of Origin, Akana, From, and Zignature. Okay. So let me so just shift gears a little bit. Somebody posted in one of my training groups this morning, um, one of the dog training groups that they, so now they're in a panic, everybody's in a panic. They shared um, a, so if you look on your bag, there's something called the guaranteed analysis, right? And it'll have the primary things of 
uh, crude protein, crude fat, crude moisture, and crude fiber. Those are the top four things that make up what's in that bag. Generally speaking, it well, it never adds up to 100% in, in any bag, right? It doesn't add up to 100%. And in most cases, it adds to usually about 40 to 50 percent, maybe as high as 60 in these higher quality foods, right? What's left in the bag? What's left? All the carbs, all the sugary based things or the things that will convert to sugar once in the body. And they don't have to be listed on the back. But she listed one today that said, 31% crude protein from Zignature. Now, Zignature is a good food. 31% protein is probably too high for the average dog. When you think protein in that percentage range with all the sugar and all the other stuff that's in that, in that bag, right? That level of protein percentage probably needs to be for a sport performance dog, an athlete, a high energy and highly uh, active, a dog that is actually going to use that energy. So I've seen that type of food and that high of a protein in a little house dog and the dog, you would look at him and think, you have a learning disability. You're crazy. You're not functioning right, right? And it's because the protein is basically, and then all that sugar paired with it is creating this sort of crazy, I can't settle down kind of dog, right? So Zignature has this high-end, high-performance kind of thing, and then they have something that's down around 25%, which is where the average sort of pet dog needs to be. So then look at the Volhard. Volhard, when you add in the fresh meat, you're back into the 28 to maybe 31, 32% range. So people are like, well, what about the average dog there? So I think there's something about the fact that it's a biologically active food, that it's real food, that the body can use energetically appropriate versus this processed and mixture of proteins. Not that we can't sometimes blend protein sources together, but when you start looking at these bags, is it animal protein? Now this one said, let me see, hold on, let me grab my phone. I'm gonna tell you exactly what it said. I took the picture so I could show it to you guys, and now I'm talking on my computer instead of my phone, so sorry about that. Let me see. Do, 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 do. So this says it had 32%. I misspoke. It was 32% protein. Oh, here we go. So the first ingredients are turkey, turkey meal, salmon, lamb meal, duck meal, and then listen to what happens though. Chickpeas, flour, pea flour, peas, chickpea flour, right? So when you step back and say, well, you didn't list all of those plant-based things, right? And you were to step back and add up all the times you heard peas and flour, you may in fact have more plant protein than you had animal protein in the bag, right? Or you may actually wind up with more vegetables in the bag than protein on some of these bags, right? So this one, again, I think is a good food, but you got to go, you got to look past that first two or three ingredients. So you now this marketing thing is meat is listed first on the bag. Well, what's listed five or six times further down the bag that adds up to the same, the same um, ingredient just 
in derivatives of itself. Okay, so you got to be careful about those things. All right, um, let me stop and say, are there any questions? Any questions about any of this? Bueller. Anybody? So just, just a couple takeaways, right? I'll just try to recap it and then I'll let you guys go. Don't over panic. If you need to feed kibble, feed the best kibble that you can afford. Learn how to read the label ingredient. Learn how to be smart about um, the protein sources and the choices that you're making. And I'll give you another example and we'll come back. Um, the example is if you've got a dog that starts, let's say you've changed their food, right? And you feel like, oh my God, their behavior is different. Something's, something's amiss here. We've, we've got to step back and look at what's going on. So I had a little dog one time that came for training and I've seen this multiple times now. And I, I reflect back to five or six years ago when I first started dog training, wishing I knew then what I know now because how much better everything would be for, for the whole solution. But this little dog, I swear he had a learning disability. He went to private classes. He went to group classes. He came for board and train. We tried, we tried, we tried, we tried. And at the end of the time that he was supposed to be here, I'm like, I've never sent a dog home that I didn't feel I had made progress with until this little guy. I mean, it's like he's a mess. And so I was sitting one night writing notes. I was, I was trying to just put all the ideas down and think it through and figure out what the next plan was and what information to give this owner of, about me sending this dog home thinking he's just a mess. And I remembered something that I had, it was one of the first times I had heard Wendy Volhard speak at a trainer's conference about traditional Chinese medicine and this notion of something called a hot dog, a dog that never seems settled, seems to have difficulty learning, always looking for somewhere cool to lay, even in the winter. Like think the dog that's looking to get its belly spread out on the tile or a concrete floor or something like that. Restless, agitated, sort of annoyed, maybe even uh, reactive and aggressive about things that there's no reason to be that <laughs> attitudinal about, right? And I thought, could this dog be a hot dog? Could he be in that? Because at first I thought this, I, I don't understand it. It doesn't make sense and it sounds hokey to me. <laughs> but could it be? And so I went back, pulled out my paperwork about what the dog was fed. This was before I asked a lot of questions on the inquiry about what you feed. And the dog was eating bison. So his protein source in his bag of food was bison. So I went and looked it up. According to traditional Chinese medicine, bison, hot dog, doesn't need to be matched together, right? So I called the owner. She took him to a holistic veterinarian for a series of tests, um, confirmed that I was right, changed the dog's diet to white fish, which is a cooling food, along with things like cucumbers and blueberries and other things that cool the energy of the body. So it's not a temperature. You're not going to feel the dog and go, oh my God, he's got a temperature, right? It's not that is sort of how the internal system works. But these cooling foods, literally in three days, all the training we had taught him snapped in and he was, he was different. He was a completely different animal. So there are dogs that have the inverse of this, right? They're, they don't have the right energy level for the breed. They seem 
sleepy and lazy and they're always trying to burrow under something warm and looking for the the ray of sunshine when it's hot um you know that kind of thing that's not so now we dogs like to lay in the sunshine so do i <laughs> so you can't just go oh my god i've got a cold dog right you might have one but you've got to look at all of the pieces that come together and then if you have this dog that is energetically cool then we add the warming food so we move into that category of um things that add heat to the body beef is a neutral food and then there you know so it gets just really fascinating stuff so i share that with you so that you look at the protein source that's in your bag and think about what is my dog's behavior could this at all be associated in some way and more often than not it is so read the label read that guaranteed analysis and add up how much does it add up to if you're in the 40 to 50 percent range realize that that means you've got 50 to 60 percent sugar in the bag not the kind of white sugar that you pull out and pour in there but all of those carb related things that are going to convert to sugar in the body so you got that going on fresh vegetables always a good thing to add fresh leafy greens are best blanch and puree them just a little bit and start adding that in there yellow squash zucchini squash red pepper yellow pepper any of that kind of stuff could be added fruits and vegetables are sorry fruits apples blueberries cucumbers cantaloupe watermelon strawberries all of that are options unless you're trying to throw a dog into ketosis who may have cancer. Now, some people are going and saying, I want my dog in ketosis to prevent cancer. That's not how it works. <laughs> it might be a benefit, but it might not, right? Then we've got to think about chemical load. We've got to think about all those other things that are going onto and into the body and trying to get that under control. But the biggest takeaway I want you guys to have is whatever you feed, go look it up and make sure you understand what's going on with that manufacturer, um, what's in the bag, how many recalls have they had, and so on, and start making wiser decisions about that sort of thing. All right, I see a couple questions. Um, yeah, I agree, Angela. It is extremely frustrating. Um, you know, and it's like, it's like even with our vaccines. So the Mars Candy Company, right, bought PetSmart. <laughs> that means they own Banfield. Why does a candy company need to own one of the largest veterinary chains in the country? I don't really believe in chain management for veterinary care. I want, I want my little boutique vet who gets to know my dog and is staying atop of, of a lot of things. I saw a post this morning about another dog injured at the grooming department at um, PetSmart. And it was funny, I don't really shop at PetSmart, but I often take my training dogs in there because it's a good place to, to, to go when it's cold or when it's rainy and there's usually a dog or two in there. And we can use that as part of our distraining. But this dog had been injured very badly during the grooming process. They had called the owner, come get the dog. Something's wrong with him. Take him to the vet and determine that his spine is now all jacked up. And he was um, not unconscious, but loopy, right? So he's not in his right mind. So theory is he fell off the table, right? What do I see when I walk back to the grooming department? There's a, a groomer who has the dog on the table with the, um, with the little leash that keeps their neck up. And she's got her back turned to the dog talking on the phone. I was like, pay attention, <laughs> right? Pay attention to your dog. He could easily fly off of there. And that's how this stuff happens. 
But in, but and, and this may be inappropriate for me to say, but to me, PetSmart grooming is the supercuts of um, grooming care, right? They've got all this turnover, all these new people, and they're not really paying attention to all the safety measures that need to be in place. So I worry about that kind of thing. And then you get into our foods and you think, y'all are putting really inappropriate things into the food bag and, 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 and then marketing to people in such a way that the people believe you. So I, I often say to people, I, I had a client last week, I went and her dog is kind of in that mode of, he can't settle. He's frustrated. Everything agitates him. He lashes out at everybody. And I said, what does your dog eat? Beneful. And I said, exactly what is an accent of pumpkin and blueberry? What is an accent? And so we pulled out the bag. We read the guaranteed analysis. We read the ingredients. And she threw it away while I stood there. I said, I am not letting you feed your dog this food. You can't do this. But the marketing engines make it sound like that's a fantastic option for our dogs, right? And it's it's kind of a sad thing. Okay, Jessica says, I've been reading about the benefits of adding sprouts to the raw diet. Have you done any research on that? Would it be overkill to add sprouts? No, go ahead, add them up. Greens are good. Anybody else? So this was more about nutrition than anything. I'll remind you that um, if you need supplementation, you have options. We didn't talk a lot about organ meat tonight. I mentioned it. You, your dogs need it, <laughs> and we know that like organ supports like organ, meaning liver supports liver, kidney supports kidney, heart supports heart, but organ meat should only be about 5% of your total diet. So where do you get fresh organ meat, right? I don't know. I mean, I, I think I could go down to some of these butchery places that are processing local animals and say, what do you got? I don't want to do that. <laughs> I just don't want to do that. So Dr. Jody has a product called Trail Mix that has um, organ in it. It's freeze-dried. I've been using freeze-dried beef liver for years as treats for my dogs throughout the day. Not a lot, but I mean, they get that's where they get their liver supplement. But I kept wondering, well, where am I going to get heart? Where am I going to get brain, <laughs> you know? And it's in Dr. Jody's product now, so try that one out. Um, things like the, the digestive enzymes, uh, Young Living has them. Uh, probiotic, prebiotic, it's all in the Volhard food already. Um, along with things that help deter uh, insect and um, parasite control. A lot of that is built into the food so that you don't then have to use add-on supplements that go back to that chemical load we were talking about, right? So um, multi-greens is one that adds greens into the diet when you can't put enough fresh greens in the bowl. I take them myself. Vitamins, minerals, there are products like um, Super B, Super C, Longevity, um, Allerzyme, Sufferzyme, um, Essential Zymes. So what does your dog need? We can help you figure out how to supplement and start adding in the nutrients that they need, even if you can't make that full switch into um, the food that does it, right? Um, if you are feeding kibble, there is a great option from Volhard Nutrition called Endurance that is a supplement. It comes in a one pound bag. You add a tiny little sprinkle based on the weight of your dog that starts to add in um, a lot of the nutrient, a lot of that digestive enzyme, probiotics, 
vitamins and minerals and starts to really increase the nutrient quant content um, of a kibble-based diet. So look at that. Larry, are you asking me if all greens are okay? Generally speaking, yes. Generally speaking. So think uh, kale is better than spinach. Broccoli, spirulina, collard greens, <laughs> whatever he'll eat, all of that is rich in nutrient. If you add veggies and fruit to kibble, what ratio should it be? Adding fresh leafy greens, Vicki, um, I heard, what did he say? Something about as little as a quarter cup for like a 50 pound dog makes a significant difference in their ability to fight disease. So it doesn't take a whole lot. And I mean, let's be honest, most dogs are not going to scarf down two cups of green anything. I'm not. <laughs> and they're going to look at you like, mm, I don't think so right? Which is why sometimes a supplement like multigreens can be helpful. Um, for the fruits, limit as a little snack, right? Think a piece of apple or some watermelon in the summer when it's hot. Any of those kinds of things are good to add, but we're not really wanting to use them as a primary food source, just as a treat, just as a supplement, just as um, getting some so, something that is fresh and live into the body. If your dog is diabetic, <clears throat> at risk of diabetes, um, or has cancer, then um, veggies, uh, sorry, fruits should be pretty much cut out. You want to limit the sugar going in. In addition to the greens, you could add things like cucumbers, you could do squashes, um, peppers. I wouldn't, I don't like green peppers, but yellow pepper, red pepper, that kind of stuff might be okay as well. Remember, we all know the things that are kind of off limits. No grapes, no raisins, none of that kind of stuff, right? So the foods that are off limits, they stay off limits, even if you're trying to move into a fresh diet. Questions? So your biggest takeaway is if you need to feed kibble, you probably need something supplemented in the bowl that is fresh and real, recently alive food, <laughs> right? And you probably need some sort of vitamin mineral supplement to add to that as well. Something, think, um, think supplement based, like we go and take a capsule or sprinkle on the food, that kind of thing to add those um, balance of nutrients. Okay, kibble, kibble generally is not enough. All right, everybody, I'm going to sign out of here. If you need me, hit me up. Talk to you guys soon.